Welcome to another edition of Conversation with the Shipmate. I'm Petty Officer Nick Brown aboard USS Carl Vinson, operating in the Arabian Gulf. Admiral Mick Pine, good morning. Thank you for joining us today aboard Carl Vinson. How are you doing? Oh, good morning. It's good to be good here. Good morning. You're looking good. You can't see his shoes, ladies and gentlemen, but he's got the shiniest shoes he does. that I think I've ever seen. And yeah. it's a beautiful morning yeah. out here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, CNO, your last conversation with the shipmate was with the uh, Fleet Cyber Forces Command regarding cyber warfare, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, and the IDC community. Now, today, we'd like to take a look into your recent position report uh, and focus on the future of aviation and also talk about some of the issues that you and Mick Pond are focused on. Okay. Now, before we get started, though, I noticed that you're both wearing the FRB coveralls. Now, these are kind of new. What do you think about them there? How do they feel? Well, they're comfortable, but I don't wear them all the time. So, uh, but what, what we need to do, with the Mick Pond and I have been talking about this, with the sailors here on the, with the Vincent Strike Group, they, get, they need to be durable. They have to have good utility. You know, do they have enough pockets? Do they catch on things? Elbows wear too much? Do they tear too easily? These are the kind of, this is the kind of feedback we need. We will evolve. I mean, we got, we got about 95% of these distributed, but we bought several increments, and we will continue to do that. So what we need while we're here and actually across the fleet, we need feedback. And we'll get this right. We'll make this an effective uniform. Sir, where, where should uh, sailors go to, to provide you with that feedback? Well, well, how about starting with the chain of command? You know, tell their LPO, uh, get online. Mick Pond's Facebook, my Facebook, uh, feedback from this, it doesn't matter. We'll take all. We'll take it Send all. Send your letters, your notes, your texts. We'll take it. Tweet. Great. And uh, Mick Pond, we have, obviously, we have the FRB coveralls here aboard Carl Vinson, but some of the other ships in the fleet haven't received them yet. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what the future is, what the rollout plan is for uh, for the rest of the ships in the fleet? Yeah, the, we'll continue to uh, issue the FRVs to units that are getting ready to deploy. It's a supply challenge. Uh, they're making them as fast as they can, and we'll get them to the ships that need them uh, just prior to deployment uh, until everybody's outfitted. Mick Pond, what, uh, what feedback have you heard from the fleet about the coveralls so far? Well, I had a opportunity last night to talk to about 300 or so chiefs and uh, if you want to talk to critics talk to uh, uh, 300 chiefs <laughs> and uh, they told me that by and large they like it as the CNO just mentioned with a few practical modifications uh, that they talked to me about um, and maybe a, a somewhat uh, different fabric slightly different fabric um, I think we're pretty close to having a uniform that everybody can be real happy with, which in and by itself is pretty amazing because I've never seen uh, in 30 years, you know, all of our sailors happy with the working uniform that we have. And so if we almost accidentally bumped into a uniform that most of our sailors are pretty happy with, with a few modifications they're going to be real happy with, why not pursue it? So we're taking that feedback. We'll go back and uh, see what it takes to make that happen. Now, the modifications that you mentioned and that the Admiral mentioned, um, it almost sounds like you described something similar to like a flight suit. Is that, is that anywhere close to what we might be moving toward? Well, I would tell you, I, when you look at the traditional sea bag blue coverall, when you look at this coverall and you look at some of the features of the flight suit and you put all three of those together, you come up with a pretty good uniform. You know, the Velcro belt maybe, um, like the flight suit has, some pockets, the weight of the blue coverall, the fire resistant properties of this coverall. Uh, maybe you have to do something to create the knees and elbows so that they're a little bit more durable. But when you put all three together as a hybrid, um, you come up with a pretty good product. So I think we'll, we'll take a look at that and see where it takes us. Now, Admiral, <coughs> I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about aircraft. Now, uh, what are your thoughts on the future of aviation? I know that there, were, um, there was a milestone with the F-35 pretty sure. recently, um, and then the, uh, the E-2 Delta um, reaching an initial operational capability. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that today? Sure, you, you mentioned probably three of the key aircraft platforms, the future air wing, because you, you got the E-2D, which has tremendous more range, great resolution, and it can net, it, it turns the air wing into a, and any aircraft that joined the air wing, like on a mission, 
to a huge network, and now you have just totally expanded this thing. There's this idea, this concept called NIFCA, which is Navy Integrated Fire Control Counter Air, but it can go into other missions. So you got the Growler, which is suppression. That's enemy uh, counter air and other EW suppression, electromagnetic suppression. I mean, you're taking a quantum leap with the Growler. You're taking another big jump with the E2D, and then you got the F-35C. It's got more weight, got more fuel. In other words, it can carry more weight, more fuel. It can jam. And of course, the Super Hornet, which is becoming the workhorse. Those are the future aircraft. Add to that the kind of payloads and sensors we got. You just described the air wing of the next decade, probably for the next decade and a half. Now, I know that recently, uh, right here on this very flight deck, we did a test with eight <coughs> growlers. Yes. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? What was the, the reasoning behind that and uh, why it's important? Sure. See, people think uh, if I had five growlers here, so you get five in the air, and you say, no, actually, you know, one's usually in maintenance, and then you might have one that has a casualty, you get three on a mission. So if you go to eight, you're, you're looking at maybe six available uh, the, to expand out, and what you're talking about is granting access. We talk a lot about joint assured access. You hear the term anti-access, area of denial. Well, you have to get in, all right? And what I mean by getting in is uh, a lot of counter air, special radars, something has to suppress that. Jam it, spoof it, communications. That's what the Growler is. The platform does, it's got the pods, okay, which it uses, which has that jamming capability. We're building a new pod. It's called the Next Generation Jam. It's awesome. I mean, it it has a, a vast uh, series of spectrums and frequencies. It, it goes on. So I'm not going to geek you out here, and I'm at the limit of what I know anyway. <laughs> but let me just say, it is a leap into the future. So this air wing went out and said, what can we do with this thing? What kind of uh, jump do you get? And it's kind of like being a knee in the curve, as they like to say. With When you get into seven or eight growlers, the capability of the air wing sort of ramps up almost exponential. Great. Now, I'd like to go back. We just talked about the growlers. I'd like to go back to the F-35. Um, I saw that you recently took a trip to Naval Air Station Lemoore. Is that true? Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I had never been there, so I needed to get out there. This is what we call a master jet base. All right? We have two of them, Oceana. A lot of people talk about Oceana because, well, it's on the East Coast. It's easy. It's right in the Hampton Roads, Norfolk area. But Lemoore out here in, and out here, out there in Central California is enormous and that will be the first location for the F-35. So you're talking new hangars, you're talking uh, runway expansion, you're talking simulator expansion, you're talking <coughs> maintenance expansion. So uh, Lemoore is going to grow. Uh, it is uh, considered by some a remote site, it's not really that remote. And in fact, you know, I was on board here, uh, Vincent, Ran into a guy yesterday, and, and we started chatting a little bit about Lemoore. What do you think of it? And the guy said, well, I spent, I've been in a about 23 years. I spent 14 of them in Lemoore. Some folks say you can't homestead there, and uh, this guy, their boss, if I might, but I'll skip the names, <laughs> he liked it. So uh, I think we need to understand and, and embrace the fact that that's our master jet base here, West. That's our first home to the F-35. Uh, let's make sure it's a, a great place, an appropriate place for our future. Do you think that that's going to build up the um, the area? Because I've, I, I spent a week in Lemoore for, uh, for training and I know that it is, by some accounts, a little remote. Do you think it's going gonna, it's gonna to do something to, to build up the, the area a little bit? It will. It, it'll have to. I mean, we're, we're going to increase the footprint. The support for that footprint will have to increase. The community relationship is terrific. Uh, it is, I mean, it's a huge uh, agricultural area, and that sort of makes sense that it would be quote unquote remote. Not gonna have a lot of cities built around it. Uh, so we'll have to uh, work around that as we do with other sites. Japan, Japan used to be a place nobody wanted to go. It was forever on the other side, it is on the other side of the world, but now we can't get people out of Japan, you know, once they get in there. We'll go to work on it and make sure that, uh, that what we have there supports our families, our sailors appropriately. Now, Mick Pong, given your background in aviation, I know that you've probably got your eye on, on the future of aviation. You kind of, it's near and dear to your heart. Um, but I'd like to, to switch and ask you a question about um, something that's, that you also have a little bit of experience in, and that would be uh, the role of leadership in today's Navy. Can you talk to us a little bit about that today? Well, uh, that same 300 chiefs that I talked to about the FRVs, we had another great conversation about leadership. 
Across the Navy, we have about 30,000, a little over 30,000 chief petty officers, and we've stacked hands, and we've, we've decided that uh, we've cr we want a definition on what it is to be a chief petty officer, a written definition, so that everybody can work towards that end. And th that definition is chief petty officers are or should be quiet, humble, servant leaders. And if someone's watching this video, I would ask that they write that down. Quiet, humble, servant leaders. Because leaders have responsibilities to set conditions and then maintain those conditions that provide all of our people with an opportunity to be successful. It does not matter who it is. They all deserve an equal opportunity to be successful. We don't make them successful, but we certainly have to provide the opportunity so that they can reach out and that they can become successful. And just as importantly, we must do this while treating one another with dignity and respect. Until we get leadership right, just about everything else is gonna be hard. It's, it's about doing it right up front so that you're not taking care of all the eaches down the road. Yesterday, uh, one of our ships visit, I said, Envision the fire triangle. You know, we can run around with CO2 bottles putting out sexual assault and domestic violence and alcohol abuse and misconduct, DUIs, you know, et cetera. Or we can get the leadership piece right, remove an element of that fire triangle, remove the heat, right? And then all those fires don't pop up, but you remove the heat with good leaders. Quiet, humble servant leaders that provide opportunity for everybody to be successful and we do that while treating one another with dignity and respect, right? Get it right up front so that you're not chasing yourself in the end, okay? It sounds like you, uh, you wanna get a more proactive approach to the leadership yeah. in the Navy. Yeah. It's about being preventive, right? Not about being reactionary. It takes, it takes effort though. Leadership, command leadership, our triads, our most senior leaders, they gotta invest. They gotta give our sailors the time to train. We gotta put the training in place. And we got to treat it with the seriousness that it deserves and that our sailors should expect and demand from us. Don't you love it when the Mick Pond simplifies it and puts it in a nutshell? It's, it's very direct and, uh, you know, a lot of times simple is good. It's easy to remember. Yeah. Fire triangle. I got it. <laughs> now, Admiral, uh, we saw your position report that you, uh, you put out was it last week. Yes. Um, and you addressed a lot of the accomplishments that we've made in a, in a lot of different areas over the past year. Of those areas, where do you think sailors on the deck plates can, can do the most to help promote that, to help um, keep those accomplishments moving forward? I think the, the area that most relates to and will influence the sailors is what we call the optimized fleet response fleet. That is uh, our approach to, if not simplify, but sort of bring a better covenant between what I do, what we do at headquarters, organized, trained, equipped folks like the, the Vincent Strike Group here, preparing to deploy, do it properly. And what I mean by that is to give, have the right shipyard capacity in place. When you bring an aircraft carrier, nuclear aircraft carrier, or any of the cruisers and destroyers with this group, or amphibious ready group, in for maintenance, they're ready to do the maintenance. The packages are written. Uh, we're not paying a premium. We give that, that uh, shipyard enough time, private or public, enough time to do the maintenance bring the people to the care, to the strike group, to the units, well enough in advance so they are manned up with the team ready to go through the training phase, the basic blocking and tackling in addition to the advanced training or the integrated piece, and then to set a stable and consistent deployment pattern to get back to a, to get back to a seven month deployment. That's our sweet spot. We've looked at that and said that gives people, that gives the combatant commander, in my view, enough presence out there to work with, at the same time it gives our people the enough professional opportunity to develop themselves at the same time. So get the capacity right, man up right, don't do needless inspections, coordinate the inspections so you're, you're not spending so much time at sea just doing inspections, and in a seven month deployment come back, you're available for surge, but then you're on call, okay, you'll just gracefully grade in readiness and less called out, and then start that cycle again. It's a 36 month process instead of a 32 month process in there. So over a, a three year pattern. And that we think the home temple, that's the percentage of time at home, at your home, over that entire cycle can rise to about 63%. We're sitting at somewhere around 50% now over that whole cycle. We can do better, we can be more efficient. 
that's the piece that involves the occurs, it involves each individual sailor, it involves leadership, bringing, being planning, being right, me, getting the capacity to write, the shipyard to write, you see what I mean. This is a whole effort. And then I've got to be square with the joint staff and the combatant commanders on what are we going to provide and uh, what's going to be extra. We're going to have to pay for this beyond you know this presence that we'll provide. Sounds like I know that we're currently on what is probably going to be a 10-month deployment, and that's, that's tough. It's a, it's a hard yes. pill to swallow. Uh, it sounds like you've probably heard the gripes and complaints of sailors saying, hey, 10 months is it's a little much. Is that is that kind of the driving force behind making these changes so that we can get back it to is, the seven it months? It is. Uh, 10 months is too much. What I mean by that, it's it's not sustainable. You, it's, uh, you can't take people on 10-month deployments, all the preps and do it. You can't take these aircraft and this nuclear carrier out 10 months at a time. One, you'll burn the fuel out before it's ready to refuel. Uh, and at number two, you'll, you'll wear out the propellers, the machinery and all that, wear out the people. And, and we need these people and that's just too much. So we need to, uh, we're getting out of a, kind of a trough that occurred when we had the sequestration business a couple of years ago. Uh, this carrier was held up in its, uh, in its maintenance cycle, an early training cycle. The Reagan behind her, ahead of her, the Bush was sitting there, not, not doing anything for a while. Meanwhile, somebody was standing the watch. The Stennis was out there standing the watch. The Truman was out there standing the watch. Their, their uh, deployment got extended. So when that happens and the next guy's behind you is late, they get held out. So you see where this is. It's a domino effect. We'll be out of this domino effect due to the maintenance hangups if we get a stable budget for about another year. Okay? I've been pretty clear with the Congress on this, my boss and all that. So we can get to that point. We can get back to that optimized rotation, the fleet response plan, we can get back to seven month appointments. So we need a stable budget. Uh, we need a not the world is not stable, but we, we need a world without any major conflict. Something like this ISIS campaign, we can handle that with the forces that we have deployed today. But uh, we can do this. We can get back there. I'm sure of it. So it sounds like that's another proactive approach to to a problem that we've uh, identified for the Navy. Mick Pond, let's talk about a subject that's nearly always close to sailors on the deck plates. Um, we just finished our latest PRT cycle and a lot of the sailors here uh, and ashore would like to know if there are any changes coming to the BCAs, the weigh-ins and the, the PRT and the way we're doing things now. The number one complaint, if you want to call it a complaint, that I get from our sailors isn't the actual physical test itself. The, push-ups, the sit-ups, and the run, the bike, the swim, the elliptical. It's, the, it's how we do the BCA. Um, CNO mentioned yesterday how we're uh, in the middle of, an, uh, I wouldn't call it an experiment, in the middle of a, a project, a process, where we're measuring body types, because body types change uh, over the years. So we haven't, we haven't checked the, uh, what's that called, CNO, the uh, anthropolectic that's close enough, close enough uh, <laughs> measurements of people for, for two decades. And uh, we believe that body types have changed, that in general, people are a little bigger now than they were 20, 25 years ago. But our BCA process is still established based on you know, those time frames, those later time frames. And so sailors are concerned about the height weight uh, more than anything else. Uh, and so, Maybe it's time that we take a look at that. Um, we're not doing that right now, but maybe it's time to look at that. When, when you look at a sailor and they look physically fit, they're, they're in good shape, and they're only a pound or two from being overweight based on the chart, or they are overweight, makes you scratch your head, right? So maybe it's time that we take a look at that. We're, we're continuously taking feedback from the fleet on physical readiness, and we're working, always working, to find ways to do it better but it's gotta be efficient, it's gotta be effective, and whatever we do, we have to be able to do anywhere in the world on any platform. So what works in the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. is not gonna work on the Carl Vincent in the Northern Arabian Gulf, is not gonna work on a submarine that's underway. So we've gotta find that process of doing business that fits our Navy as a whole, and that's not always easy because we're so diverse in our missions and where we're at and what, what, what kind of access we have. But uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to continue to work to make improvements. Thank you.
Uh, now, Admiral, you said before that one of your favorite aspects of your job is being able to come out to the fleet, uh, get on the deck plates, talk with sailors, do stuff like this, and participate in, um, in re-enlistment ceremonies. What are, the, what are some of the things that you feel like you're going to take away from, from your fleet visits this week here in the Gulf? Well, I'm always inspired. Uh, I, I work in Washington, D.C. People say, this place is uncertain, the budget's uncertain, where are we going? There are personnel changes, leadership changes. What I love coming out here is there's no uncertainty. People know precisely what they're doing. They're ready for the next mission. They're getting up. As, as we look around us, there's ordnance moving on the deck, and there's a sense of purpose here. That's very inspiring to know that, okay, things are good out here, and that's what really matters. But you know, we've been talking about uniforms and we giggle, we say, ah, why are we talking about this all the time? Well, because they put it on every day and that's, it's on their body. So we, we've learned a lot about what is the right kind of wear for them day in and day out. We talked about deployments. You know, the question we just had, hey, what is this 10 month deployment stuff? Uh, we talked about, okay, advancement. Well, how are we doing on this? What should I look forward to? And there's a lot of strategic questions. How's this campaign going, this ISIL campaign? What about Europe? What's going on out in the Pacific? You know, they're here, at the, as they say, the tip of the spear. Well, they are. There's like three spears that, that we sort of have, and people at each of the tips over in the Western Pacific and the, and the guys and gals there in the Med. But anyway, uh, we talked about all of that, uh, and they would just kind of know this Navy that they've invested themselves in, where's it headed? Where's my country headed? So uh, it's all inspiring and, it, and it's right, but then we get down to the, kind of the basics, the boots, you know, the, the uh, uniform and all that kind of business here. It's great. Uh, sir, McPond, is there anything that you guys would like to add before we wrap up? Okay. As CNO and I are sitting here uh, taping conversation with a shipmate, I'm, you can't see it on the camera, but I'm looking around and I'm just seeing sailors working and hustling and getting airplanes ready for uh, flight ops. It's pretty impressive. I'm in awe. This visit has put me in awe, it, mostly with the attitudes of our sailors. They know they're out here for nearly 10 months, but it doesn't seem to phase them. I'm sure they feel it, and I'm sure their families feel it, but the, the positive attitude they have uh, makes me ashamed to complain when I'm in traffic in Washington, D.C. Yeah. So I won't complain about traffic when I get back because they're out here doing the heavy lifting for our Navy and for our nation. Uh, talked to a young lady at uh, dinner last night for Thanksgiving. I said, so what do you think about this 10-month deployment? And she said, I don't know, Mick Bond. I don't have anything else to compare it to. This is my first deployment, so I guess everything else will be easy after this. So, uh, and then lastly, i uh, just like to mention to our sailors what I call foundation to success. I say it all the time, I'm not gonna get into the, the details of it, but it's work hard, stay out of trouble, and be a good and decent person every single day to the best of your ability. And I'm confident that you'll have a successful career and you'll be success, successful in life as general. It's a privilege and an honor to be here and the opportunity to do this conversation with a shipmate episode with the CNO. Very much appreciate it, sir. Thank you. So you're always big on three things, so I'll give them three things. These people are always thinking about war fighting first. We're operating forward out here, and they are ready. So that kind of wraps that piece of it up. It's Thanksgiving, and I want to say thanks. Thanks to you, Brownie, for this uh, opportunity. Thanks for a great Mick Pond here for our good Navy and, and uh, all these folks and people in the sound of our voice. Thanks for serving. Admiral McPon, I'd like to thank you as well for taking the time to come out and uh, chat with me. Uh, I really appreciate it. I had a good time. Hope you had as well. Um, and we look forward to our next opportunity to sit down with you and discuss uh, what the Navy is doing and where we're going. Thanks again. I'm Petty Officer Nick Brown aboard America's favorite carrier, USS Carl Vinson, operating in the Fifth Fleet Area of Responsibility.